Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to 2020 Ryan White Clinical Conference. We're very pleased to have you uh, come back and see us today. Uh, just a reminder and a thank you to my co-chairs, Dr. Laura Schiever and Dr. Michael Sag. So just to review what happened yesterday, we learned about comorbidities in older adults with HIV. Uh, HIV-related complications, HIV and the liver, and implementing PrEP. And there were multiple Meet the Expert breakouts where we had lots of great participants, participation from all of you, and we really appreciate that. Um, today is STI Day, so we're going to learn about sexual health in adolescents, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, and we also have Meet the Expert breakouts today. So great news. Historically, when we do webcasts, uh, they're for the plenary lectures only. But this year, because we're using the Zoom platform and are able to, to record the breakout sessions, those will also be available for your review. So look out for announcements when they're available. So uh, exciting stuff tomorrow. So we want to... <laughs> Uh, get excited about today, but also tomorrow, that will be the last day of the clinical conference. And you'll note that it's starting a little bit later during the day, so please double check that. Um, we really want to make sure that you make it to the end uh, tomorrow to hear uh, the HIV epidemic panel discussion um, on ending the HIV epidemic with uh, Dr. Sheevers, McRae, Cargill, and Holberg. So looking forward to hearing that and having you all participate. So a reminder about the CME credits. So again, there are multiple profession uh, continuing education credits available and your participation will uh, lead to you being able to get these credits. However, they're not available after each day. They're gonna be a, become available to you at the end of the conference. So the, this clinical conference goes through Wednesday. And so after the conference ends on Wednesday, then you will be able to access your continuing education credits. So a reminder about the platform tools available to you. So one is my schedule. So that'll help keep track of what's coming up for you and which breakout session you, you signed up for. You can interact with other attendees throughout the entire conference um, using the chat function. You can directly communicate with them, sort of like a virtual way of meeting them in the hallway during breaks. Um, we encourage everyone to complete their evaluations. Those are very important to us to see how uh, we can continue to improve this conference. So you get that um, announcement every at the end of every day. And we do appreciate you um, getting to those. And then under the materials tab, that includes the pre and post conference materials. So there is a notes section and some people have had a bit of a challenge using um, uh, the notes view. So if you were to look at the bottom of your screen and you see this icon notes, uh, some people have noted that if they are typing during someone's presentation using that notes tab, they're unable to see the presentation. So we instead advise you do not use the, the notes tab that's on the bottom of your screen, but rather if you're going to the home page of the um, clinical conference platform, you'll look on the left hand side and you'll see that icon on the bottom called notes. And if you use that, um, it won't interrupt with your view of the, of the conference itself. So uh, just a helpful tip for some who are interested in that. Polling, again, another challenge using uh, this, this technology that's new to many people. Uh, throughout the sessions, we've been using the polling feature in order to, to hear what's happening with all of you and to get a pulse on your questions uh, and your understanding about material and also just an idea of who, who the participants are this year. Um, but if you happen to have on your computer or iPad or et cetera, um, a full screen view that when the polling comes up, you're not able to see it because it may pull up behind your view of what's ha happening on the stage. And so instead, we recommend that when there's a polling question, if you do not see it on your screen, then you can minimize your your screen or, or um, drag it and move it over to the side. So then the, the polling uh, options will be, become visible to you. So they're always there, but they just might be hidden behind something. So we're gonna show you um, this. We're gonna practice here with a test poll. Uh, did you register for the virtual 2020 national 
Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment, which starts today. So we'll poll here and then um, we're gonna see, demonstrate what it looks like if you were to, to um, uh, move your view so that you're able to see it. Terrific. So you should be seeing the poll up uh, on your screen and the and the results as well. Um, and so just an example of, of just moving your, your full view out of the way so that you're able to see it. Okay, hang on a second. Okay, thank you for that. So many people are joining the, the next conference, which will be really exciting. There's a very chock full agenda of some really exciting um, presentations. So a reminder about the, the National Ryan White Conference on HIV Care and Treatment. This again starts today. The opening session uh, starts right after the clinical conference ends. And so the end of um, tomorrow, um, will be the panelists, I'm sorry, the end of the, the day with the meet the breakout sessions. Uh, 15 minutes after that the, is the opening session for the national conference. And so that will become, that will be available to you using your regular sign in um, and your regular view for the clinical conference. If however, you've registered for the national conference, go ahead and use that sign on um, to, to sign on to the, the um, opening session and all the other sessions uh, for the national conference. So what will happen in the, um, the national Ryan White conference, um, the opening session will highlight Dr. Schieber and Dr. Engels, Asbar and Fauci. And so it will be really exciting to hear um, their perspective on ending the HIV epidemic. So again, thank you, welcome, we're excited today to uh, hear about uh, our updates on sexually transmitted infections and sexuality in adolescence. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Allison Agu uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Internal Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She's core faculty at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine's Leadership Education and Adolescent Health, Medical Director at Johns Hopkins Access and Care Early Young Adult Transition Clinic at Moore Clinic and Program Director at Johns Hopkins Pediatric Adolescent Young Adult HIV AIDS Program. We are pleased to welcome her today for her presentation, Managing Sexual Health and Adolescence. Thank you so much, Dr. Agu. Good morning and thank you for having me. It's exciting to uh, be here and not having to travel anywhere. Uh, so here are my disclosures um, on this next slide. And uh, the learning objectives for today are threefold. One, to describe the reasons for increased risk of STIs among and HIV among adolescents, but also really importantly to list important aspects of a detailed sexual history for adolescents, including importantly sexual and gender minority adolescents, and then identifying approaches to improving sexual health among adolescents, a task for all of us. So first, why discuss sexual health among adolescents? I think the key here is adolescents are having sex, period. That's it, we're having sex. Now the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is done every few years among high school students in ninth to 12th grade, showed that 40% had of adolescents had ever reported having sexual intercourse. And 10% of those had reported having four or more partners. Now, 30% of those who had had sex reported during the prior three months. And of those, about half of them had not used a condom with that last sexual encounter. 14% did not use any pregnancy prevention. And about a fifth of them had used alcohol or drugs before that last sexual intercourse, again, impairing it in judgment. 7% had been physically forced to have sex when they did not want to. And with all of that, only under 10% had ever been tested for HIV. 
Now, youth are at increased risk for STIs and HIV, and I think important for us to really go through why they're at increased risk. So first, there is some biologic risk anatomically for young women. The, uh, the cervical, uh, endocervix goes from being columnar cells, which are more permissive to STIs and, and trauma, to then squamous epithelial cells, which are more protective. Also, we know circumcision decreases the risk of acquisition of STIs and HIV, and circumcision rates have fallen over the past several decades decades and are probably at their lowest points among the people that are adolescents now. There's lack of immunity from prior infections and what contribution that is, is, is very variable depending on what um, you read. And there's just a greater risk for physically traumatic sex with, again, first times intercourse, uh, the, the cells, et cetera. And then there are concurrent STIs, which you'll hear from me today, but also from others talking about um, STIs in the U.S. There's a brain development thing. There's the adolescent brain, and there's the maturation of the executive suite, which is a center that balances risk reward, helps youth with problem solving, prioritizing, thinking ahead, all those things that we, we tease adolescents about. And it's important to, to note there are multiple factors that, infect, that affect how that maturation happens, environment, culture, trauma, and they all, again, impact development of that center. Cognitive development is important where adolescents go from concrete thinking, it's black or it's white, and they're not really able to see the gray and therefore not really able to see the uh, perceived consequences. So this may all sound bad and we end up trying to debate, is it risky behavior or normal development? And I, I say it's probably a bit of both. So cognitive development goes from concrete thinking to more complex and they have that limited ability to perceive consequences. But it's no accident that adolescents are, are able to, to push the envelope on things because they don't see those consequences and they're able to do major and impressive things. There's risk taking and experimentation, exploration of sex, of you know, hiking high buildings, fill in the blank. And that's part of what they do. It builds self-esteem, self-confidence and self-identity, autonomy and peer acceptance and respect. So there's good parts about this. Psychosocial development is, is critically happening at that stage where they're invincible and, and are seeking independence at the same time that there's less parental and guardian supervision. Um, and they can, there can be some impacts like runaway and truancy as they test the, the boundaries. And so I think it's risky behavior and it's normal development. So it's a bit of both. However, when we see STIs and we see that increased risk of STIs, we need to remember we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg. And there's so many things that are underlying why an adolescent may present with an STI. Everything from values, beliefs, assumptions, environments, et cetera, then are, are contributing to where we're seeing the STIs. All right, so here's an AR's question, and um, I hope we get it right. Um, so which of the following is true about sexual health in adolescents? And you get to poll. So one, their rates of sexually transmitted infections are declining across the U.S. Um, pregnancy rates are increasing uh, across the U.S. among adolescents. Um, C, sexual and gender minority adolescents and youth have higher risk of STIs. And D, that we just have no data on STIs in adolescents. And so I'll look for my AV people to help me to make sure that I see the poll when it comes up. All right. Do we have a poll? Maybe. Here we go. All right. Oh, okay. Says that you guys are paying attention and really aware of what's happening out there. So absolutely right. So sexual and gender minority adolescents and youth have higher risk of STIs. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So first, in terms of STIs, among adolescents, uh, the graphic on the right side of your screen really shows the, the blue and green bars, again, for males and females and showing really high incidence rates of, of chlamydia um, among the youngest individuals ages 15 to 24. But we're seeing higher rates for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, primary and secondary increase in, in ages 15 to 24. Chlamydia highest among young women and the rates have again increased among males, females, gonorrhea the same. And when we try to think about reasons why we're seeing this increase, some is it we're just actually seeing increased incidents. Maybe we're seeing increased screening, particularly among young men, and then also more extragenital screening. So I think it's a combination of, 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 of things that why we're seeing the increased rates. HIV among youth, youth have continued to represent about one in five of new, all new HIV diagnoses. Um, this data is from 2017. And about half of those infections are seen among African-American youth, um, which is a huge disparity in terms of what proportion of the population they make up. Um, Dr. Agu, yes. I, I apologize. We need you to reshare your screen so that we can see your slides again. Oh, what happened? Sorry, when we bring up the polling, we have to have you reshare each time. 
Okay, sorry about that. I got all excited and kept going. All right, so HIV among youth, um, again, as I was saying, one in five, and then we're seeing the large majority of, of infections occurring in young men who have um, sex with men or same gender loving um, males. So when we look at the, the incidence rates and we look at these graphs, essentially, again, in the sort of the turquoise line or, or, or MSM or male to the male sexual contact, which we recommend rep represent the highest proportion of diagnoses. And then in heterosexual contact in the purple, and then in the insets, uh, uh, male to male se sexual contact and IDU and injection drug use. But importantly, when we look at, there are about 51,000 youth with HIV, and it's thought anywhere from 40 to 50% of them are unaware of their HIV status. Um, when we look at trends in terms of infection, overall, we've seen maybe some declines overall um, among youth in terms of new infections, particularly among young women. But a young, among young MSM, um, there's been a decrease among African-American males and decrease among white um, MSM, but increases in uh, Hispanic Latino youth as well as Asian youth. So some, some trends that we need to, to pay attention to. So when we say sexual and gender minority youth, I think it's really important for us to know what we're talking about, be on the same page. So what does sexual minority youth mean? So it's youth who identify as same gender loving, gay, lesbian, bisexual, questioning, or some other sexual identity and or have sexual contact with persons of the same of both sexes. And then gender minority youth are youth who identify as gender different from their gender assigned at birth as non-binary or questioning their gender identity. And together, this group is often referred to as LGBT. LGBTQ. And the next slide, I really want us to really break down that even further because it's LGBTQ and then there's I, intersexual, A, asexual, and P, pansexual, but oftentimes don't get included. So thinking about all of the spectrum of, of sexual and gender identity um, is important. But also the concept of intersection is critical. Now, each letter represents, again, distinct populations with their own health concerns, but you must always think about subpopulations within each race, ethnicity, age, SES, region, et cetera. The intersectionality of those things considers individuals multiple identities and the ways in which they interact. And this is really critically important, particularly now as we think about the different movements that are ongoing, particularly about racial um, equity, et cetera, and how youth within um, subsets of youth can have different um, levels of stigma and inequity. So risk among sexual gender minority youth, you guys were 100% on, which means I need to ask a harder question next time. Um, so compared to heterosexual and cisgender youth, uh, SGM youth are more likely to have had sex at a younger age, so before age 13, more likely to have greater number of partners, more than four partners, and more likely to have used alcohol or drugs before less um, last sex, less likely to use condoms, and more likely to have not used pregnancy prevention during the last sex. And important when we talk about how to um, uh, target and, and, and elicit um, need for these things, we can tease that out. Young transgender men and women have the highest rates of HIV and STIs compared to um, other SGM youth. And increased HIV STI risk may be associated with commercial or transactional sex, unemployment, substance use, violence, incarceration, a number of, of, of things can, can underlie that. And then HIV prevalence among transgender women is often is discussed, but HIV prevalence among transgender men may be relatively low, but a 2011 study suggests that transgender um, um, MSM are at higher, at higher risk for also requiring HIV. So something to also think about. So what can we do? I think it's really, I, I, I talk do and gloom, but then it's what can be done to assess and decrease risk because we're seeing this youth and how can we address them? So first, annual preventive health visit is really key. Uh, it's a, an opportunity to not just talk about sex, but it's develop rapport and trust with our young people. Normalizing discussions about sex, but sexuality as well, assesses changes in evolution. I love these pictures of Marseille Martin, who is a, the young woman on Blackish, which is a show my kids love, but really over the past eight years, you've seen her go from a little bright eyed, uh, basically toddler to a young mature woman and all the changes that occur in that. And if we have the same discussions at seven that we do at 14, we're missing something. So thinking about how we evolve with the person in front of us. It's an opportunity to provide comprehensive education and delivery of health services and really start to impact decision-making about healthy relationships, sexual behavior, prevention of STIs, even before they are sexually active. It's an opportunity to do screenings and vaccinations. And so we talk about this HEADS assessment and what is included, home, household, education, employment, activities they're involved with, drugs, 
sex sexuality. So it's part of it, but recognizing all of these things ultimately end up affecting sexual um, risk and sexual interaction. So if we understand all of that, we understand how they may or may not begin be contributing to the tip of the iceberg, which is just that, that SDI test. It's a conversation, not a survey. So we're not checking off boxes. We're conversing with youth in building that therapeutic relationship and how allowing them to trust us. Um, and we really, it's an opportunity to, to build report. And oftentimes we think about this as a pediatrician's purview, but I say it's any clinician's purview, um, particularly as we know that young people are less likely to see their pediatrician for their, their regular visits as they, they end age out of school ages. And so when we encounter these youth in our different spaces, it's an opportunity for all of us to take ownership of the sexual history and the HEADS assessment to help in terms of guiding and prevention. So what is in a sexual history? First, it's got to be confidential. And the youth need to know that you're going to talk to them and not share with everybody. And it's not judgmental how we ask our questions and being very non-assuming in our questions. And so if we ask a young, a young man who's interested in, in sex with, with other males and we say, how's your girlfriend? You shut him down because you've just let him know that you're not actually interested in knowing that he may not be interested in girls. And then you've lost the opportunity to, to actually engage on that level. Um, be specific. Are you having sex? They look around. They're not having sex right now. So the answer is no. So being specific and not being afraid to ask the questions in multiple ways. And then thinking about the five Ps, partners. So what partners they have, prevention of pregnancy, protection of STIs, what are their sexual practices and past history of STIs or, or several of the, of the five Ps. Avoiding medical jargon. If you ever use the words unprotected anal intercourse, you've just lost that youth. And then engaging the adolescent in the process of adopting health promoting um, behaviors. So engage them in what they think they can do to, to decrease their risk. What are the barriers? The number one thing we hear is time, time, time. A third of adolescent annual visits, because of that time issue, had no discussion of sexuality issues. And when that discussion happened, and these are actually videotaped uh, conversations, they occurred for about 36 seconds, an average of 36 seconds. That means zero to much longer, but 36 seconds was the average. And they were providers who had obvious discomfort if they were taking a sexual history from an SGM youth. And SGM youth often can feel marginalized in non-inclusive health settings by the posters we have, the questions we ask, and so being mindful of how we set the stage for not being able to hear those youth or them not feeling heard. And then providers often have inadequate training of how to elicit disclosure of sexual or gender identity for young people and for people in general. So what's involved in taking an, exclusive, an inclusive adolescent sexual history? It's again, engaging youth in other aspects of their lives before addressing in sex, drugs, and other sensitive topics, being comfortable ourselves. We have an issue with sex in this country where the sex is everywhere, but we're very uncomfortable in asking about sex and engaging in sex. And so we've got to be comfortable. And adolescents prefer if you are direct, um, put them at ease and let them know it's, you know, I don't need this to be embarrassing, but I ask everybody and it's important. So normalizing it. And then remembering that how a person identifies their sexuality or gender does not always tell you who they have sex with or how or who they are attracted to. And we need to make no assumptions about but their activities as well as who they're attracted to and being open and non-assuming. So be aware that there are a wide range of sexual behaviors, activities, and expressions. You've got to remain open and neutral and then provide comprehensive and non-stigmatizing information about sexual and reproductive health. Um, promoting healthy sexuality, even if the teen is not sexually active. Asking about sex will not make the teen then go have sex, right? It just lets them be open that you know that you're open to discussing sex when they're ready to talk about it. So STI screening and prevention, we must really think about basic decisions about STI screening on sexual behaviors and anatomy and body parts used for sex through that inclusive sexual history. But we also know that given the social desirability and whether or not we have parents in the room, et cetera, adolescents may be less likely to, to share. So testing when you think, you know what, they meet the criteria to test, we should just test, including extra dental chlamydia and, and gonorrhea screening in patients with a history of oral and anal sex and asking about oral and anal sex. Um, and then in terms of screening, at least annually, but we may need to think about doing it more frequently, uh, depending on the risk behavior and what they disclose. The 2015 STI guidelines talk about STI testing and recommendations, and it's using that testing, which has really become easier. There's less sticking Q-tips in, in, in orifices, et cetera. 
a lot of uh, providers are really afraid of having to do a pelvic exam. And so it may actually not be indicated, except when there's persistent vaginal discharge, there is dysuria, other symptoms, there's dysmenorrhea, where basically there, there are reasons to say you have to do a pelvic to, to assess what's happening. Um, but a pelvic may not be a, an absolute part of, a, of, of doing a full um, a sexual history and exam. So not being deterred by that. Now, HIV testing about adolescents, about half of adolescents we talked about, unaware of their status, and those barriers are theirs and ours and a system. And so thinking about where those barriers are for you and how to, to overcome them. So adolescents we talked about may have a perceived low risk of infection. So if you give them, hey, do you think you need to be tested for HIV? The answer is no, because they don't perceive their risk is high. There may be concerns about confidentiality and then access to services as well as the provider's willingness to test them for those. So what are the recommendations? This is it, just across the board, universal screening, 13 to 64. The USPTF our guidelines are a little bit different starting at 15, but really 13 to 64, we should be thinking about screening. Of course, all pregnant women, including adolescents, and then repeat screening at least annually um, and more frequently if they're at risk. If there's a family diagnosis, not forgetting that there are adolescents who are diagnosed with HIV all the way into adolescence. And so if there's a family diagnosis, doing the math and going back and testing those youth if they need to. If there's clinical suspicion, or if the youth just asks to be tested, we shouldn't try to defer them or deter them from, from being tested. And then what can we do once we, we recognize their increased risk? Of course, talking about sex, sexual uh, prevention and, and barriers, et cetera. But PrEP, um, either FTC TAF or FTC TDF, approved down to weight greater than or equal to 35 kilos, which is the large majority of adolescents are in that in that. Um, uh, weight base. Recommend, re remembering that FTC TAF is only approved for individuals not born with a vagina. So what are the barriers to PrEP? I've told you the adolescents, one in five um, are new HIV infections, yet they make up less than 10% of PrEP prescriptions. And so thinking about how we can overcome that barrier. Um, we do know there's a decreased adherence among adolescents and young adults when they start PrEP. And so thinking about how we can support adolescents to take PrEP instead of saying adolescents shouldn't get PrEP. Um, rem remembering that the, the barriers that impact uh, the things that rep impact HIV acquisition H and STI acquisition also impact PrEP acquisition. Um, and so thinking about how to address those, uh, knowing what our minor consent laws are and, and most youth can, can consent for PrEP. Um, there are concerns for confidentiality in terms of testing and, and what lab reports show, et cetera, and knowing what those are as we counsel our young people. And there's barriers to disclosing same-sex behavior or sexual risk behavior. So concerns that if they say they want PrEP, that means that they are now disclosing the same-sex behavior and the potential stigma that be related to that and recognizing that and addressing that. And then there's just lack of access to comprehensive culturally and developmentally sensitive care. And so how can we overcome those barriers? Family planning and reproductive health. So pregnancy among adolescents, you guys got it right, has actually declined significantly, about 64% between 1991 and 2015. So major decline in, in, in pregnancy among adolescents. However, even with that, the large majority, 80% of adolescent pregnancies are unplanned. And so we need to be thinking just like when we're thinking sexual history, et cetera, and counseling, non-judgmental, empathetic, non-threatening, engaging, supportive, and not assuming an adolescent who defines or identifies as a, a SGM may not have any risk for pregnancy and actually thinking about that and including that in our, in our questioning. All options for family planning and reproductive health should be available to all adolescents, including abstinence. So not just targeting one thing and, and having that be your, your one song. The reason for the decline in, in pregnancy rates is, is likely related to some of the ease in what we provide, including the long acting reversal of contraceptives. And you know, there, there no, there's no contraindication to using that in adolescents and, and thinking about removing the need to remember a daily thing, et cetera, has been really important. So in terms of family planning and reproductive health for SGM, again, it's important to have open Open discussions with all youth, including SGM youth, about reproductive health and family planning. Sexual behavior and sexual identity are not always aligned, and so not making assumptions. Many SGM may have sexual encounters that may not be predicted by their orientation, and so therefore conversations about birth control is really critically important. Uh, and this actually was an op-ed looking at actually pregnancy among youth who identify as, as, as queer, and so being thoughtful about, you know, asking the questions in a way that are non-assuming um, to address all.
We have another uh, ARS question, and that's intersexual history, which of the following is not one of the five P's. Um, so I'll pause and let you tell me that, and then I will remember to share my screen again. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yes. So you all are listening, which is great. Um, and I had the opportunity to see the question that the, the comment that, that somebody wrote. Absolutely. Uh, pleasure should be one of the P's. It's not normally listed, but it actually should be because I think we have to be very mindful about there, there are actually benefits to sex. It's, it's, it's actually pleasurable. And if we try to make it so clinical for adolescents, they're less likely to engage with us. So, but yes, pleasure is one of the five Ps. Pills is not. And you guys got that right um, with 95% of you getting that right. Um, also, remembering to think about the opportunities to, to prevent other things. So immunizations for adolescents and young adults meant you're targeted around uh, preventing STIs. So human pap papillomavirus or HPV, there is an app or a vaccine for that, which markedly decreases rates of HPV. Hepatitis A, um, particularly a young MS among young MSM, um, should have been, uh, been uh, vaccinated at a younger age, but if they have not taken the opportunity to, to screen and then to actually um, vaccinate them. Same thing for hepatitis B and then other vaccinations as we, we go along Tdap and MCV and flu and thinking about how to optimize that. When we look at percentage of coverage for HPV vaccine, it's really actually unfortunately uh, abysmal in a lot of parts of the country with 40% or under um, getting um, vaccinated in a large part of the U.S. And this is a safe and effective vaccine. So thinking about that um, in terms of uh, prevention for adolescents when we encounter them. Um, so looking forward, I was worried I wouldn't get through all of it. Uh, looking forward to, to question and answer um, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Agu. That was a really excellent presentation and with really important information. Um, I really want to thank you for highlighting uh, the that healthcare providers need to normalize discussions on sexuality with adolescents and that we can play a role in how teens view their sexuality and can create a safe place where they can discuss their questions and concerns. So I think we often, because we recognize that teens are so strongly influenced by peers and social media that sometimes it feels overwhelming like, well, what can I do as a healthcare provider in my 15 minute visit that can help create a safe place? But we really can. Um, but as given that teens are so strongly influenced by peers and social media, are there specific tips that you recommend um, to these adolescents when they're viewing sex-related information online? Or do you uh, steer them towards certain um, certain websites, perhaps? Or yeah. any thoughts on so that's, that? That's, yeah, that's a great question. So I think, you know, one, you bring up an important part. And I think a lot of times we as adults think they don't want to hear from us. The reality is they do want to hear from us, right? They don't want to see us wagging our fingers and saying negative things to them, but they do want to hear about us, about it from us. And so that's why starting at an early age and normalizing conversations and showing your willingness to talk about it, they're more likely to come to their appointment with, oh, Dr. Agua, I heard this and I want to make sure that's true or not true and asking them where they get the information. And at times in our appointments, I actually will say, well, show me, show me that website and letting them share what, what they're, they're seeing and where they're getting information and then allowing them to become ambassadors by arming them with the right information they can then go out and share with their friends. Um, I do Advocates for Youth. It's a great um, uh, uh, organization that has youth-friendly, youth-relevant, created by youth content to share to youth. And I oftentimes stare adolescents to that, to that organization's website. Very good information. Excellent. Thank you. We have an audience question. Um, how do you approach asking about and explaining gender identity to younger adolescents presenting to the office with possible gender non-conforming clothing or behaviors. Do you have a script that you'd like to share with the group? Yeah, so you know, I don't have a script that I actually share. I think what I do, I can I can tell you my approach, and I'm happy to to see there's the Advocates for Youth has lots of really wonderful, and, and there are other um, seekers that has a lot of uh, information that's helpful for providers who sort of need a script. I think for me, what I do is 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 not assume. I actually start asking very early um, about 
how do you how do you see yourself or what what would you what do you how do you like to be referred when you think about yourself how do you like to introduce yourself and really just not taking it back and allowing people to define their their pronouns right and you know a lot of people will you know, providers will say well that means i'm suggesting to them no no you're not suggesting to them you're normalizing this is a normal question to be able to ask people to allow them to define themselves and so i don't just wait for the youth to actually come in looking as if they are in a in a wearing clothes that are different i actually ask all my youth so how do you prefer and then i make it part of my normal questioning and then they hear in turn wow dr agua in this office is open to hearing that i may be thinking differently about about x y and z and we know younger and younger adolescents are starting to feel and actually young kids are starting to feel the permissiveness less stigma to be able to express that and i think that openness has allowed you to then come out and then do this earlier yeah, that's happening. definitely a really positive yeah. thing that's been happening, I would say, over the last, what, five to 10 years. Really exciting. Um, yes. Some additional audience questions somewhat related to what you were talking about. What screening questions do you ask adolescents to elicit sexual and gender identity? So you talked a bit about gender, or, uh, gender identity, um, but for sexual preference, what are the genders of your sexual partners? Do you identify with the sex that you were born as? Um, perhaps a, a little bit more if you could talk about that, please. Sure. So sometimes I, I, I start by, you know, you're asking about school and activities, et cetera. And then I will say, well, well, tell me when, when you see your ideal partner, right? Who, who do you, who do you see? Instead of saying, what does your boyfriend look like? What are your girlfriend? But who do you, who do you, who do you see as your fantasy person? And then you allow them to then say, oh, okay, I see, et cetera, et cetera. And then that then lends itself to more questions right so do you are those all the partners you you see or and then they oh well, yeah but i also like him and her and so then that allows it to then be open up so it, it flows from there when you let them define what, what they see and then you, you you use those cues to move forward great a really relevant question here and i bet a challenge in some cases how yeah. do you handle getting the parent to leave the room so you can have a more open discussion with teens Yes. So <laughs> it's a great question, you know, and now as I parent a 10 and a soon to be 13 year old, I find myself having angst about <laughs> leaving the room, but I set it up very early. So we basically say, and I start around 10 years of age, I say, you know, so-and-so is starting to reach the age that I give them the space to have conversations with me alone. Cause sometimes they're a little embarrassed so they want to talk about things with you. So I don't start when the kid hits 13 or where I'm suspecting something's going on. I introduce it actually fourth, fifth grade, they get some time. So they can start talking about hair under their armpits, et cetera. And then it gets to the point where the kids are like, all right, mom, time for you to hit the road so I can talk to that to Agu, right? So, <laughs> so you set it up. It's rare that I have a parent that absolutely refuses to get out of the room. It occasionally happens. And then you, you sort of say, well, this is, you know, you, you mentioned the laws, you mentioned what they have a right to do. Um, but I, that oftentimes doesn't happen if you set it up at a very early age. And what about for a provider who, let's say, has not been their primary care provider and maybe it's a consultant or a walk-in clinic or something else like that? Um, what, what guidance would you give that provider to get mom or dad or guardian out? I think it's the same thing. So in my, in, I have my HIV and, and STI hat, but I also have my general peds ID hat where we have kids come in for, you know, Lyme disease, et cetera. And I say the same thing. So-and-so is, you know, a certain age and I'm going to also give them time to, to answer questions on their own. And it's amazing. It's amazing how oftentimes when those parents leave the room, things are elicited. So the kid who has Lyme and depression actually is questioning their sexuality and is, is depressed because there's no room for them. Right. And then you can feed back to the, the pediatrician or the provider to help that. So I just make it, a, this is a normal part of what we're going to do. And it's not related to your kid. It's what I do for all kids. Great. Thanks. Uh, a logistical question. How much time do you allow in your practice for these sort of interactions? Um, that's a, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a really good question. And I, and I think, you know, certainly we are balancing, um, so many, uh, what's we're looking for, um, restrictions and, and demands on our time, right? And we're, you know, all the screenings, the blood pressure, et cetera, that we're doing. I would say that the large majority of kids, those things are really probably this much and the, the sexual health and psychosocial are that much. And so I just prioritize it, you know, so, you know, we go through school, et cetera. And then I just say, you know what, we're going to ask it. And then if, if there's some things that I need to ask again is schedule a follow-up to do it. Right. So you just say that you're going to ask it just like everything else is a priority. This is a priority too. 
Thanks. Another important logistical question, when prescribing PrEP for adolescents or young adults, or we could say even STI screening or treatment, um, that are for those adolescents or young adults who are still on their parents' insurance, how do you address the explanation of benefits letter, uh, which can include specific medication names that insured send the primary insurance and holder, which may be a a, a way that um, of unintentional disclosure. We yeah. Use. So this is something we deal with all of the time, and I think certainly um, the clinic that I work in, we're we're lucky enough to have Title Ten funds where we can actually not have it go on the the parents' uh, insurance. Um, in other cases where we are restricted, we actually try to find out what the explanation that EOB shows, so we know what that's actually going to show. We've talked, actually called insurance companies. We've done all the, the legwork behind, but I think the best op uh, option is to try to have it where it doesn't even go to the the, the the parent insurance if you can. But if you're limited, then trying to figure out how to mitigate that the best that we can. A worst case scenario, I say worst case because you're sending that adolescent someplace else. Um, but if we have to do it at the health department or something like that, which again is not my preferred way, it's to use Title 10 and to go through as much as possible ways that the kid is the, gonna stay in clinic and get it done. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we still have some time um, while we're waiting for our next speaker. So we'll go through some more questions. These are really terrific. Um, what are your thoughts about universal urine testing for GC chlamydia and pregnancy at well adolescent visits do you notify them of the results and how do you offer blood tests? Really interesting. And so I think certainly if the question is, do I universally test for GC and chlamydia? So yes, I mean, I certainly do. And having diagnosed pregnancy in an adolescent who um, was not sexually active and swore up and down, you know, so I do test. They just, you know, it's part of the guidelines and we, we, we recommend testing at least annually and going from there. In terms of universal pregnancy screening, I don't necessarily universally pregnancy screen. I, I, I think I ask more questions and then do it as, as, as I need to or my suspicion is there. But the, the STI screening absolutely across the board. I talk about family planning and talk about, you know, pr pregnancy prevention across the board to all adolescents, um, it, as, as I mentioned, but they don't do universal pregnancy screening necessarily. Yeah, and I think question. the question is kind of interesting because it, it specifically talked about urine screening for GC chlamydia, Yes, uh, right? Oh, and yeah. so that may imply certain sexual activity. Um, right, so let me step back. So absolutely. So universal screening, um, urine, absolutely. But as I said in the talk, you know, you're, you're in screening absolutely, but we are missing if we don't do extra general screening, oral, anal, and even, you know, anal, we oftentimes will, young MSM will do anal, but females, we won't do anal. And I think that's us in our biases and saying, oh, well, she's only going to use her vagina for sex. No, thinking about, we should also do anal screening for women as well. Um, and asking the questions to allow them to then say, yeah, I, I do um, do anal. And then also screening if we, we have concerns or they've mentioned them. Great. Um, can you uh, point out any resources for best ways to talk about practices without using jargon? I find myself toggling between trying to avoid slang terminology and not wanting to sound overly clinical. So that's a good question. So, I, you know, I mentioned Advocates for Youth and Seekers are some of the websites that and organizations that have good terminology. Sometimes, you know, we we actually are, are lucky enough. We have some uh, young adult um, advocates and peers in our in our uh, youth advisory board and our, our clinics. And so I ask, so what's the going term these days? So I know you don't want to sound like you're trying to be cool because they look through that and they all of a sudden like, no, Dr. A, not cool. So don't do that. But there's some terms that are like a top or bottom or whatever that, that are actually actually not clinical, but they know exactly what you're talking about, um, that I think it, it can be used. But I can absolutely share uh, at the end of the second class on the, the, the resources for those, those sites that I think are great. Uh, there was a question about what are Title X funds and how might someone access those? Yeah, so Title X funds are funds aimed at pregnancy prevention, STI prevention, and STI treatment um, for clinics. And they're funds that you actually apply for. Um, they're, federal, they're federal funds. And there have been reported to be some changes to happen to Title X, and so I'm not sure what's, you know, where we're going to be. But right now, uh, we happen to be a Title X clinic, and so clinics can apply for that um, through federal funding. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Agu. That was really excellent. Thanks for answering all those questions. That was really uh, fabulous. You're um, welcome. I'd like to now uh, move on to our, our next speakers, but thank you very much.